Secret meetings, threats of sanctions and a last minute reversal. They've all led to the biggest demonstrations in Ukraine in almost 10 years. Are the Russians to blame? And will people's anger force Ukraine's government into yet another reversal? This is Inside Story. Hello there, a warm welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. It's been an astonishing turnaround by the government in Ukraine, ending hopes of a trade deal with the European Union. These pictures are from Sunday when riot police came out in force to control tens of thousands of protesters. They're angry at the government's reversal and demonstrated in front of President Viktor Yanukovych's palace. Ukraine backed out of a deal which was due to be signed with the EU on Friday after several secret meetings with Russia. The public show of force was the largest seen since the Orange Revolution in 2004, during which peaceful protests brought a Western leading government to power. This time, the number of protesters has not been sustained, and the government is showing no signs of backing down. The protesters, however, are defiant. Here's some of here's what some of them have been saying. I came here to demand a better country, for my children and grandchildren to have a future and a better life. Out with this authority. Out. I believe we are a European nation. Maybe the government doesn't think so, but we think so. Russia is outdated. It represents the past. I don't want to live in a country where one man decides. I want to live in a country where the people make decisions. President Yanukovych has appealed for calm. Everybody has his own point of view on acts in history. But I would like to ask people not to politicize this difficult historical event. This will create tensions between people and make a disconnect in our society. Now, Russia and Ukraine share much of their history, but since the fall of the Soviet Union, relations have been tense. In the 1990s, they were marred by territorial disputes. They signed a friendship treaty in 1997, which brought a period of improved relations. But the Orange Revolution in 2004 again raised problems. And in 2009, Russia cut off gas supplies to Ukraine in a dispute over prices. That caused mid-winter fuel shortages across Europe. Moscow also opposed Kiev's desire to become a member of NATO. The Kremlin ramped up the pressure, and in October, Ukraine gave up that bid. So, with this checkered past in mind, let's explore why Ukraine has again turned back to the old Soviet fold. And here to do just that, we have today joining us Ostap Semerak in Kiev. He's an advisor to the opposition group Batkivshena. In Moscow, Pavel Falen Felgenhauer, a defense analyst and columnist for Russia's online news website Novaya Gazeta. And in London, Lilith Gevorgian, a specialist on Russia and the former Soviet states for IHS Global Insights. OK, first of all, let's take you back to those protests that we saw, especially on Sunday. And Ostap, just how strong is the anger in Ukraine over its backing out of this EU deal? So the question is that on, uh, uh, on this uh, Friday we have to sign or not to sign a cessation agreement in Vilnius uh, during the summit of uh, EU Eastern Partnership. And um, as, as you know, President of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, announced that um, he is going to, to sign this uh, agreement. But unfortunately, uh, last week, uh, Ukrainian government stopped uh, this uh, process. And just for today, we have uh, an extraordinary situation when, when government stopped this process, but president still has uh, right and choice uh, to to do this, and we expect that he will do uh, he will he will do this. And uh, uh, yesterday and a few days ago, a lot of people, hundred thousand of people, uh, on streets of uh, Kiev and all around the the country, um, supported this European integration process. We should note, and though, we should note, Ostap, shouldn't we? Just to, to jump in for a moment, because we should note that today, Monday, uh, those numbers have diminished quite rapidly and we're not seeing more than a thousand people out on the streets. So uh, are they going to be sustained? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about tomorrow, about Sunday. Um, we, we have, uh, we had uh, 100, 
100,000 people in Kyiv. That's only in Kyiv, but uh, on other cities in Ukraine, we, we also have, uh, had a lot of uh, meetings. Today, Monday, today is working day and uh, great rain in, in Kyiv. Uh, we have uh, a little bit, no, we have less people, but we appointed a uh, meeting at uh, seven o'clock uh, the evening so let's see in three hours uh, what will be but uh, still we are we are keeping this uh, this not ending uh, meeting till uh, summit on Vilnius uh, the, the president has called on protesters not to politicize this issue but it is political isn't it uh, you know, started uh, this process was started not by political parties, but uh, by the civil society and NGOs. And uh, uh, after political parties joined this this process, but we have to understand that uh, signing or not signing this agreement that is political choice, and that is not choice between east or west for my country. That is choice between uh, future and past. And uh, we understand all of uh, a lot of people in Ukraine or majority in Ukraine understand that signing these uh, documents with the European Union that is uh, start of great um, reforms in Ukraine. Um, this document uh, contain one thousand um, uh, page pages, and uh, that is uh, great. Uh, uh, very detailed uh, prog uh, program of reforms for my country, and that is very important. We are not against uh, our neighbors. Uh, we, we we want to have good future for our children. Okay, Pavel, let, let's bring you in here and, and just try to get to the bottom of, of what was behind this turnaround. Uh, talk of secret meetings with Putin. What was the context of those meetings? Russia has been uh, for uh, several, already half a year, uh, very seriously pressing uh, Kiev uh, not to sign this agreement. And so right now for the Moscow, this is some kind of, uh, well, uh, bonus that this happened, that there may be, actually didn't happen, that the agreement has not been signed. Uh, and, and Russia was telling Ukraine and actually that uh, very serious economic and political sanctions, especially punishing economic sanctions, uh, would be imposed. And uh, uh, actually some sanctions have been already imposed on some Ukrainian uh, companies and Ukrainian Russian trade has been diminished. And Russia was offering also perks to Ukraine, saying that it will, if Ukraine does not sign uh, the agreement with the Euro European Union, if Ukraine instead signs uh, into a, a customs union with Moscow, uh, Ukraine will get cheaper natural gas and uh, they'll get other kind of perks and uh, everything is going to be good for Ukraine and if it uh, do, does not sign and everything is going to be bad for Ukraine if it does sign. And President uh, Yanukovych uh, actually said uh, uh, recently that it was kind of Russian uh, blackmail that moved him into not signing and backing out of this agreement. though. Later, that was not fully confirmed. Uh, so, yes, this is a very important thing. Apparently, the Kremlin agrees with what was said once by a veteran American political uh, scientist, Bigsmir Brzezinski, that with Ukraine, Russia is always an empire. Without Ukraine, Russia is never an empire. So, the Kremlin agrees, and Kre the Kremlin sees as critical uh, the participation of Ukraine in the Russian-led integration mm. of uh, post-Soviet sp uh, states called, n named as the coming U U U U Eurasian Union. Absolutely. We'll be looking a little bit more at that uh, slightly later in the program. First of all, Lilith, uh, do you agree, do you see this move as one of blackmail on, on the part of Russia? I think it's um, it's quite a simplistic approach. Um, I have to disagree uh, with the term blackmail. I think there were a number of factors that um, came into play uh, during the negotiations. Uh, first of all, because both European Union and Russia have been uh, struggling and fighting over Ukraine um, uh, either side, so we're trying to uh, truck the country into their respective blocks. It has put Kiev in some sort of a, a peculiar position where it could have uh, picked and chose uh, which uh, 
um, policies or which offer would have benefited the country the most. Uh, the, the issue is that uh, economically uh, speaking, Ukraine is in a dire state and it has immediate um, uh, financial uh, assistance needs. Uh, in the past two, three months, we've noticed that there have been um, discussions, ongoing negotiations with IMF and the EU about this issue as well. EU has effectively said to um, Ukraine that they have to go through some painful uh, macroeconomic decisions to unlock this financial assistance. On the other hand, Russians um, also have uh, financial and economic leverages over Ukraine and um, in terms of the immediate gains, it appears that the Russian offer was much more appealing. And secondly, is the political, um, and it concerns to current government and more precisely the current president who's looking for re-election mm. in early 2015. Ostap, I mean, that, that's a fair point, isn't it, Ostap, uh, that short term, Ukraine does benefit more from a deal with Moscow than it does from the EU, which would involve plenty of reforms and the costs that those entail. You know that's 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 not true to uh, to say that uh, what what we will get in the short terms because we really do not uh, know what's 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 the proposition. But uh, I want to stress that uh, for for my country, this uh, this agreements with the European Union that's not the deal about money. That's the deal about reforms in in my country. And we understand that in short terms, probably it will be hard for our society and for our economy. But in in a long term. Terms, in medium terms, uh, we have great um, example with with Poland, with other countries, uh, with the changes in in economy, in in society, with democracy and with uh, with the freedom in my country, and that is the the best the best deal. And uh, you know, uh, more than 50% of uh, of people in in my country are ready to pay this uh, uh, to be free, and. Um, probably we will be successful in this way. There's also another key demand of both the protesters and the EU that's causing trouble with the government, and that's the release of the former Prime Minister Yulia Tymoshenko. Now, she's become a symbol of Ukraine's troubled democracy, and on Sunday her daughter had this message. All I can say is that the Ukrainian people, as well as the opposition, should fight and stand for our national interests, for the fulfillment of the conditions by the president, and to sign the agreement. The chance still exists. We hope that it will happen and that it becomes a reality. Uh, Lilith Govorgian, to what extent did the EU demands for Tymoshenko's release cause Ukraine to back away? To what extent is she still a central uh, figure in this in this battle over over Ukraine I think it was important both for Ukrainian government and for some uh, European leaders, I have to say here, because the Tymoshenko issue has been discussed um, for so long and some strong messages have been said um, uh, uh, by European Union, some European U Union leaders as well. So there's an overwhelming feeling that they cannot really backtrack on this issue. However, had the, uh, the both parties uh, wanted really to press ahead with this deal, I think they could have found a solution to Timoshenko issue, uh, maybe a, a, an interim one, maybe a, a, her, her um, a visit, to, a long visit to Germany. Uh, but the point is that um, because the deal has uh, fallen uh, through, uh, the, the issue now appears to be uh, much more serious than in reality it was. Well, Stop, how, how much of a threat do you think Timoshenko does pose to the government, the current government? I, I said that Timoshenko is one of the strongest uh, oppositional political leader, and I am absolutely agree that Yanukovych is afraid about his re-election. And that is the main, the main problem uh, of her keeping uh, in a jail, so that is uh, politically motivated prosecution. And uh, that is absolutely understandable why uh, European Union demand to, to overcome this problem of um, uh, exec, uh, politically motivated prosecution. And Timoshenko is one of the, uh, the, the best example of that. And 
I, I really feel that uh, government and especially President Yanukovych, uh, they are afraid about uh, her being in, in a political process and uh, they try to keep her out of, of the political process and uh, we do not have even um, free uh, opportunity to communicate with her mm. when she is in a jail and in, in, a, in a hospital, jail hospital. Uh, Pavel, clearly Tymoshenko does represent a threat to the current government. Uh, to what extent do you think this deal with Moscow is about uh, President Yanukovych's re-election in 2015? Well, obviously, for Viktor Yanukovych, the main problem is the holding on to power. And also, he is following the tradition of Ukrainian po foreign policy since Leonid Kuchma, who was two-term president of Ukraine, and Yanukovych was his prime minister, actually. It's trying to play the West against the East, to kind of go to the West and say, if you won't give us perks and if you won't give us money, we'll go to Moscow, then going to Moscow and say, if you will not give us lower prices for gas and some kind of loans, and then we're going to go to the West. And uh, Kiev was actually trying to play it out right now with this coming Vilnius summit, and actually I believe they overplayed their hand. Right now, both uh, Brussels and Moscow are saying flat, either you have a, a free trade agreement with us, or you have a free trade agreement with them. And I don't believe that there is any right now solid agreement between Kiev and Moscow. Because in Moscow they say, okay, if they postpone the signing of the association and free trade with uh, Brussels, that's wonderful. But then they have to sign into the uh, Russian-led uh, customs union. And only mm. then they're going to get uh, what Russia has offered them. So right now the uh, Ukrainian government and President Yanukovych are caught in the middle. Uh, they're not getting much from both mm. sides uh, and right now are actually a bit in a distress. And of course uh, uh, it's a not very popular government to begin with. And there's not only right now Tymoshenko, there's uh, Viktor Kuchko, the uh, champ on um, heavyweight uh, boxer who's also a very po power, powerful right now political figure. Uh, so uh, Yanukovych is in a rather bad slot uh, as he is right now, uh, not being in good relations with either Moscow or Brussels. And or it, with is, his it, own is, it not, is it not unfair of the EU and Russia to put countries such as Ukraine in such a position where they have to choose? I mean, is, is it not the responsibility of these bigger nations and group of nations to allow both paths to exist simultaneously? Uh, well, that's what uh, President Vladimir Putin was saying. We, we also want an agreement of uh, free trade with the European Union, but uh, we will better uh, get it a better deal if we go in as a big customs union. Uh, Brussels says no. If you have a customs union, if you have a customs union with Moscow, no free trade agreement with us, because right now the Russian uh, wet customs union has different. Uh, a lot of the technicalities of uh, uh, needed for trade are different in Europe and in Moscow, in Russian uh, um, integration um, union. So uh, this is not easy to uh, put together, and so Ukraine is actually in a position when they have to choose, mm. which is against their uh, their political instincts. They have been deliberately not fully choosing for a very long time. The Ukrainian uh, uh, political elite does not want to become, like in the Soviet times, a kind of just simply uh, Russian um, um, viceroy sitting in Kiev. Okay. At the same time, they don't want to uh, fully break relations with Moscow too. Okay, we're just going to look a little uh, ahead now as we have been talking about the Vilnius summit, which is starting at the end of this week. Now, that's where the EU is still going to be inviting a number of other former Soviet states to join uh, its so-called association agreement. And German Chancellor Angela Merkel had this to say to Russia. The countries decide on their own. No third country has a right to impose a veto. 
And then, apparently to reassure Moscow, she did add that the EU's association agreements with six Eastern European countries are not directed against Russia. Russia is our strategic partner. The European Union wants to cooperate with Russia. Uh, Lilith, what pressure have we seen Russia putting on other countries to not sign this EU agreement, being forced to make that choice that Pavel was talking about? Well, um, Armenia is uh, the recent example, and uh, what we're seeing um, has happened with the Ukrainian U-turn, uh, we've seen uh, Armenia doing it in um, uh, early September, uh, after a meeting with the Russian president, the Armenian president uh, announced that the deal, which was uh, more or less finished and ready to, to, to be initial, uh, it was abandoned. Uh, however, I have to be uh, very clear that uh, the uh, conditions that Armenia is facing and the, the level of dependency that Armenia has on Russia, particularly in terms of the security, cannot be compared to Ukraine. Ukraine is, is a heavyweight uh, compared to, uh, to Armenia and it had um, also other choices uh, to degree. So, um, but, but in, in in the sense of the pressure exercised um, on the uh, members of Eastern uh, Partnership uh, uh, countries. Um, okay. I think Armenia is a very good example. Okay, I'm just going to keep Russia it moving because we are running a bit out of time. Uh, Pavel, to what extent is this a big boost for Putin and his Eurasian Union trading bloc, which of course he's looking to form uh, by 2015? Well, of course, I mean, it seems to be a, a big bonus, though it's not clear how it's going to work out further on. Uh, the Ukrainian government says that maybe they'll sign this uh, association agreement in January. Uh, they're, not simp they're not closing the option fully. Uh, most likely they're waiting what kind of uh, offer Moscow's going to come mm. up with. Also, uh, Moscow hopes that the present uh, uh, massive protest demonstrations in Ukraine will titter out by the end of the year and there will be no political changes in Ukraine and we will be able to continue to negotiate with the Yunukovych administration. Uh, but of course Ukrainian politics are not fully, uh, I mean from the Russian point of view, not fully understandable. No one knows for sure who will be, will be Yunukovych re-elected or not. Mm -hmm. There's a very strong opposition. There's a, a, a split uh, political elite, a split country. And uh, so Moscow hopes that Yunukovych will stand out the storm and move in our direction. But this is not a foregone conclusion, and everyone understands that. Yeah, OK. And Ostap, will that be a great loss for the Ukraine if it does move towards Moscow and abandon the EU? You know, as, as I mentioned, uh, more than more than half of, uh, of Ukrainian people wants to 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 go to uh, association agreement with uh, European Union. And uh, when we are talking about future of Ukraine, uh, comparing um, these two custom union and European Union, we understand that. Uh, um, my country can be stronger when we will be reformed and uh, when we will have chance to be in a big uh, European family and we feel us as, as Europeans. And on the other hand, we understand that Putin is playing game to, to make Ukraine uh, weaker and uh, uh, he is not playing game to, to make Yanukovych stronger and to re-elect him in Ukraine. And we, we, we have to, to remember um, 2004 year when, when Putin supported Yanukovych and he was failed. Okay. So um, we, are stand, we are standing on, on the way to, to be reunited in our big Ukra uh, European family. And the last 30 seconds to you, is the Ukraine ready to be further integrated into the EU? Well, it appears not at the moment. Um, the country seems to be um, still divided. I do agree that uh, long term, both economically and politically, Ukraine needs a convergence with European Union. However, at the short term, both the opposition parties and the government have to be uh, much more honest, less populist, uh, take care of the economy, pull it out from the recession uh, and get a stronger negotiating position right. and really uh, prioritise uh, the, the, uh, the goals of the country, okay. both for the economic and political development. And Lilith, there we have to leave it. Thank you very much to all our guests for joining us in today in Kiev, Ostap Samarak in Moscow, Pavel Felgenhauer and in London, London Lilith Gervorgian.
And thanks very much to you two for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us any of your comments, do email us your thoughts at insidestory at aljazeera.net. From me and the whole team here, goodbye for now. <laughs>